Hello, everyone. Welcome to Masterius. Come on in, grab a seat. I'm Julie DeBoer. I'm an artist, uh, one of the founders of Masterius and the host of the Artist Diaries, digging deep beyond the palette. And I look forward to digging deep into the life and art of master artist Sandra Duran Wilson. If you're new to Masterius, welcome. We're happy you've joined us. Masterius is a supportive and non-competitive community where growing artists like us receive monthly mentorship from your choice of master or professional artist. We do everything in small groups together and in our larger community in our weekly events like today's chat. Um, we are all about connecting, so please use the chat function to introduce yourself and to put your comments and questions as we go. You can toggle it to everyone and then everyone will see your comments and questions. I am so pleased to introduce you to Sandra Duran Wilson. She is an internationally recognized artist, author, lecturer, and juror. Her innovative, award-winning mixed media art is influenced by her extensive scientific background and her experience with synesthesia, a fancy hard name to say uh, for experiencing one sense through another, like seeing a color when you hear music. Sandra has degrees in both fine art and cognitive science and has authored six books for Penguin Random House on art techniques. Her artwork is driven by curiosity and is included in collections around the world. She's represented by galleries in the US and Australia, and she's done an art installation for the world premiere opera, The Revolution of Steve Jobs. Sandra works from her studio in New Mexico. Welcome, Sandra. How are you? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Hi, Julie. I'm doing great. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. It's nice to see you. Nice to be together. Um, we, uh, so myself, I'm Julie DeBoer, as I mentioned. I'm also an artist and I do these large whimsical acrylic paintings and I'm also a, a mentor at Masterius and a member receiving mentorship. Um, and uh, one other thing, I'm humming and hawing here, sorry. We, um, after every event, I usually stick around to talk about Masterius for those uh, people who are new to our community and who are interested in what we're doing and how to join the community, how to work with a mentor, what, what does mentorship mean, all of that sort of stuff. So I'm going to stick around after the event uh, for, for anyone who's interested, stick around. Um, and we will give away a one month events membership to uh, someone, a newcomer um, after the event, uh, just so you know so that you can come to all of our live weekly events. Um, anyways, so we can dive in. I think that's most of the business side I had to have to cover. Um, so Sandra, uh, you have been a mentor at Masterius for a few months now, and you're working with both aspiring and emerging artists. Is that right? That's correct, yes. Awesome. That's fantastic. Um, I'm excited to hear a bit about your journey as an artist, um, how, how you got going. Uh, was that something you pursued or, or something that pursued you? And uh, yeah, a bit about, about your journey. Well, I grew up in a family of both scientists and artists. Mm -hmm. So both those possibilities were always in front of me. And I think that's something that's very important for a lot of people that are growing up in families where the art isn't seen as important. Okay. And for me, it was, you know, even though the artist in my family, they might say, oh, it's so difficult to be an artist. They never told me not to do it or that it wasn't important. Mm. I think that makes a big difference. Um, so anything was really possible. And I had a lot of freedom to explore. I grew up on a, a small town on the border of Mexico and Texas and two older brothers. And we were always just out um, all day long exploring and friends had a ranch. And so I was out riding horses and just um, experimenting, playing with everything. And I would go to my father's uh, office. He was a physician. My mother was a nurse. And so I grew up kind of around 
medicine and microscopes. And I painted my first abstract painting when I was about probably four or five, looking through his microscope and painting what I saw on this slide. So that was a, a, a good beginning. And my great aunt was a traditional plein air landscape painter who taught both my brothers and I how to oil paint. And so mm -hmm. at four and five, I'm painting with oil paint, you know, and mm -hmm. my abstract pieces. That's amazing. I love that. And you were already blending science and art. Yeah, I thought, I thought it was natural. To me, it was the same breath, you know, it's like breathing mm -hmm. in, breathing out. And because it was all part of that curiosity of, well, what would happen if I did this? And I think children are naturally curious, you know, we're always experimenting and playing with things. And so it just kind of went hand in hand with, with art. Um, I kind of continued, uh, you know, regular uh, oil painting in a traditional fashion until I was a teenager. And then I got more into, I was painting sets and doing large uh, murals and oh, wow. then just kind of uh, turned more to um, all kinds of different things. I wanted, you know, it was different clothes or purses or something that was really popular at the time. And my mom said, no, you can't buy that. So I'd go make it. <laughs> so I kind of designed my own thing and come up with it. And, and then um, when I was a, a teenager, probably about 15, 16, I started taking those to shops in, in the town and putting them on consignment to sell them. And then I, I um, you know, I was out on my own early started college at a young age, I was 17, and then um, ended up leaving school and took a very non-traditional path. And so I had to have art make money for me. Mm -hmm. And so I turned to jewelry making. And I did that for a long time. But I still had to work two jobs for a long time. Okay. Are you, and, and did you eventually become a, uh, like a full-time artist? Are you doing that now? Oh, yeah. I've made my living as an artist for over 20 years. And, um, you know, in the 20 years before that, I was doing jewelry, art, and other things to supplement mm -hmm. my income. But yeah. I was always a full-time artist. Mm hmm. Lovely. Not everyone can make a living doing it. So that's always good to hear. Um, it's tricky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not easy. Part of the reason why we do mentorship, uh, instead of trying to figure that out on our own. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you started in oil, you got into, um, you know, clothing, jewelry. Um, it sounds like you've probably dabbled in many different mediums since then as well. And, and tell us about where you landed or what your favorite medium is that you prefer to well, I switched to acrylic when I went back to college in my 30s, mm -hmm. in my early 30s. And um, I was doing both my, my science degree and my art degree simultaneously. And I was going to school in Albuquerque. I live in Santa Fe, so it's about an hour drive away. Okay. And I was driving back and forth. And I had to, we were working on large canvases. And so I'd have to put the canvas in the back of my car in order to take it home and take it back. And oil, it just didn't work well with oil. So I decided to switch to acrylics. Okay. And, you know, to learn a new medium. It's like, oh, okay, well, what does all this stuff do? And that just kind of ignited the, the chemist part of my brain, because that's the science I had started out earlier when I was 17 was chemistry. Mm -hmm. And so I just really jumped into that and explored all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of acrylic artists that I work with have never done that. They just use the acrylic paint. Mm -hmm. But there was a there was an experience I had as a child that I think really sparked my interest in in mixed media. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And when I was probably in grade school, there was in a small town, there were no art classes or anything like that. And both my parents worked, so my mom needed something for us to do after school. And the neighbor was a retired art teacher. And so she sent my brothers and I next door to her house several times a week to to do Mm. things. And we did all kinds of great stuff, like everything from drawing and painting to uh, enamel work to we made big puppets, marionette puppets and just all kinds of stuff. And I think that really put my mixed media, you know, it, it just it was in my soul. I really liked that. And so that combined with exploring the possibilities Mm -hmm. of acrylics kind of got me down that path. Yeah. Those early influences, I think are really formative. Um, I I love that, 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 that took root early for you. And I'm just thinking, reflecting on my own story. My mom uh, was a self-taught accomplished oil painter and she painted oil and she kind of did the same sort of work for 40 years. And so that was kind of my picture of what an artist was. And and like you said, not a lot of acrylic artists get into the mixed media. Uh, And I'm one of those people for sure. It's something I look at longingly thinking, oh, that looks so exciting. (laughs) I just need to do it. (laughs) Yeah, that's that's great that you had that uh, neighbor in your life. What a gift. Who else um, had a big influence in you becoming an artist? Um, well, my my great aunt Santa Duran, she, um, you know, definitely was a big part of that. And just you know, when you're little and you're the youngest, it's kind of like oh, getting the attention to really have somebody help you understand so I think she was a big part of it and different people I mean different artists that I met along the way when when I first came to this area Santa Fe is known for all of the artists that live here and come here and I was really fortunate to know a lot of them and so you know watching their careers and I remember one day going into a gallery and this is after I had already finished art school, but yet I was still working, um, you know, a full-time job and then trying to do my art full-time on the weekends and at night. And I went into this gallery and there was a a show that was just going to open and in the, uh, director of the gallery was saying, oh yeah, she just got back from France. She was over there painting murals and did this work and, you know, and and he's kind of going on and I was like, that's the life I want. Mm -hmm. And I decided then and there that, okay, that's what my life is going to be like. Wow. And that was probably the biggest aha moment. And I said, okay, this is what I need to do to get there. I mean, I had this fully formed picture of like, I want to be in Europe doing these and having shows and, you know, going around the world because I always love to travel. Mm -hmm. And that's what I get to do now. That's so exciting. (laughs) So uh, since we built Mastery, I have had that similar aha moment because whenever I'm connecting with one of our masters, they're at an airport or in Italy or in Mm -hmm. France, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I think that's the life that I want. Yeah, fantastic. I'm glad that you saw that and you grabbed hold of it. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's, you know, that is important to first get a picture of where you want to go, Mm -hmm. what's that path look like. And once you can kind of grab onto that, then you can say, okay, these are the steps I need to take to get there. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I started, you know, having a business orientation. I mean, always doing that. I, I knew, okay, well, this is, this is what I have to do. And I think that's a lot of what I can bring to people that are starting out at whatever level they are, but if they want to make their art a business, or even if they want to have it more organized or be more clear in why they create. I mean, not everybody creates to sell their art, 
Mm -hmm. I mean, art is a very healing process. A lot of people create just for the for the personal satisfaction of being able to create because, you know, we're all artists. We have to create. It's just part of what we do. It's yeah. in our DNA kind of thing. Yeah. And obviously that was in your DNA. Do you still feel that impetus uh, when you are hard at work these years later? Do I feel the feel what now? I'm sorry. The, that that motivation to create because it needs to come out of you or are, are you more I mean, yeah. I'm in the studio every day almost. And if I'm not in the studio, I mean, because there's a lot of other things that you have to do as an artist, you know, sure. it's, we got to be in our studio all the time. That would be wonderful. Mm -hmm. But, if, you know, that's probably about half of it. Mm -hmm. So I figure if I'm in the studio for 50% of my time, I'm doing good. Mm -hmm. And, but there are other parts of that process that are just as important. And one of the pieces that's very important, I think, is just to refill the well, I call it. And it's that place where you just have to kind of go and sit and be and not do anything. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's just, you know, I, I love to go hiking. We, we do a lot of day trips from where I live up to the mountains or sometimes just I have a beautiful garden and I just spend a lot of time outside in nature. And that for me is refilling the well. Mm -hmm. And that inspires me. And gives me a lot of ideas uh, because refilling the well is about observing. And that I think is what artists do is we observe, we take things in and then we bring it out with our own hands, our own voices. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely about observation. And every single person, you know, has their own glasses that we see the world through. Yes. You and I could witness the same event and we would have two completely different experiences. Yeah, I love that. I'm actually writing that down. <laughs> <laughs> and that was actually a lot of my studies in, uh, in, in school, in cognitive sciences. How mm -hmm. do we uh, take information in and yeah. how do we retrieve it and put it back out into the world? And so I would do a lot of experiments, you know, gathering information, what people observed and, and how they learned and, and how they put it back out. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we learn in so many different ways, not only with our eyes, our ears, how we encode information through writing, whether it's with our hands or typing, two mm -hmm. different pathways in your, in your brain mm -hmm. and talking about it hearing it so there's there's more than one way to learn something and the physical aspect of movement is another uh, way of learning right yeah so let's dive into the the science piece for you um because you are you're blending those two uh, and the synesthesia which I yeah say. can you tell us a little bit more about what that means and then what that means for your artwork well, it's really a crossing of the senses. And in technical scientific terms, I, I, I don't know if they're changing the parameters of what they say, but um, you know, usually it's um, one particular, like a letter is equated to a color or a sound is equated to another sense. Mm -hmm. But mine, I would say is just, is more loosely based. When I hear music, I'm going to see colors, but I'm not going to say, oh, orange is, a, you know, B sharp or A minor or something. I'm, I'm just more listening to the music, feeling the sensations. And I only have it if I have my eyes closed. Like I put my music on when I'm driving down the road all the time. But when I'm in the studio, I don't listen to anything unless I want to create to it because I do find that it is influencing my color choices. But the way I've always used color is, and I, I call it optical mixing. And I really discovered this more in using acrylic because I'll put a color on, and I was just doing this in the studio about an hour ago with a piece I'm working on. And it was kind of a, a rosy red color over some acrylic textures. And so the acrylic 
texture will grab it and give it, you know, some areas that be darker, some lighter. But that was completely dry. And I was adding a transparent red iron oxide, mm -hmm. which is a bit more of a, um, it's not real orange, but it's a little more orange than the bluish red I was using. And so I just put that over a very, very thin layer and wiped a lot of it off. And the vibrancy of when the eye looks through those two colors, mm -hmm. it's just dynamic. Whereas if I would have taken those same two colors and mixed them together, it would have been a different story. It would have been a different sound. Mm -hmm. And that's how, you know, it, to me, if I mix those two colors, it would have been a real, like a big bass sound, a real grounding sound. Hmm. Whereas putting the colors in these layers, it's more like, a, mm, you know, it's, it's, it's a couple of voices coming together. Okay. Oh, I see. So it's, so it's richer. Yeah. Oh, that's really fascinating. So, um, and and <clears throat> you don't if you don't have music playing while you're doing this, but you're still having the sense of the sound as you're painting. Mm -hmm. So cool. what I my my next step of what I'd like to do because I I used to play music a long time ago. In fact, mm -hmm. that was what I wanted to be was a, a rock and roll musician. You know? ah. <laughs> but I actually studied classical Spanish guitar for a long time, but I just it just didn't come as easily to me as as mm -hmm. art did. And so I just kind of kept going back into painting, back into visual arts, but I've always loved music. And so what I'd like to do now is I'd kind of like to reverse engineer it, to take one of my paintings and sit down like with a synthesizer or something and really compose music based on what I'm looking at. Yes, that would be phenomenal. And I've done collaborations with musicians where oh. I painted particular pieces for their songs. Mm -hmm. But I think it would be fun just to kind of go back and try and do Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Oh, can you imagine? You're going to find some real sweet melodies, I imagine. I think so. I think so. Because oh. I really like electronic music and mm -hmm. very ethereal type of music. Um, some of the music I listen to, I mean, here, there's a lot of native drummers that I listen to and chants, and those have their own kind of rhythm and movement. And sometimes it's more, the composition will be more based on the rhythm of what I'm listening to. Okay. And then the colors will be more of the, the what I see with the sound. But if um, I just have one of my groups, you know, start to explore this using uh, music and mark making, like think of staccato, like, t -t 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 you know, your mark making is going to be very different than if you're thinking of lyrical or flow where things are going to be. Wow. So you can take that music into your studio and even just do some warm up exercises with it moving your body, moving your hand and understanding, you know, like I look at your paintings and there's such a flow to it. And what would happen if you added a staccato on top of that? Would that change something? Would that change the feeling? Obviously it would change the, the composition. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really intriguing. I'm curious for our audience, um, do any of you, are, are you aware of the synth synesthesia phenomenon where like I, I'm aware of words um, I usually I usually see letters and words um, in my imagination and they're they're colored so a, a certain word would be a colored word um, yeah is that something to our to our guests that you're aware of T tell us about your connections which which senses are crossing over for you just curious well, I think from what you just described, that is actually a sense of synesthesia. Mm. And there was a there was an experiment that we did. I mean, it wasn't one we came up with. It's an older experiment. But you show somebody a word, like the word uh, green, mm. but it's written in red letters. I mean, it's written in red. Yeah, yeah. So then you, you know, it's like flashcards. And then you ask them, well, what was the card? 
what did it say, what I just showed you? And a lot of times they would remember the color, not the word. Yes. So that's kind of one way of testing for synesthesia. Mm. And um, for me, it's um, numbers actually have sounds. So when I was when I was in school, I had to take a lot of statistics in order for experimental science. Mm -hmm. And you know, statistics is really not math, it's really a language. Mm -hmm. But it's dealing with formulas and stuff. And so most people, and myself included, find statistics very difficult. Mm -hmm. And I found that I could only do my statistics really early in the morning when I first woke up. And I get up and I do my statistics homework. And by 10 or 11 o'clock, I was like, how the heck did I do that, you know? So there was a part of my brain that was very early in the morning knowing this language. Mm -hmm. and But numbers for me, if when I'm, I discovered this when I was putting the data for experiments into my database and I'm punching in all of these data points, a song would come up in my head. No way. And then later on, when I was home, I would paint that song. Wow. So that's kind of the way it works for me. Okay. That's really interesting. So it's actually not just crossing over once, but like twice. Right. Yeah. And I know accountants that numbers are specific colors, and they can remember really long strings of numbers because each like, you know, eight is a yellow and this nine is another color and so they visually see it i had a really interesting conversation with a woman uh, in one of my art fairs that i was doing and she had that and so she was explaining it to me and other people it can be a smell or a taste associated with a word mm -hmm. so it's uh it's it's that's rarer the the music and color correlation is the most common okay and I think a lot of people actually have it. They just aren't aware. Mm -hmm. And I just, I always thought that everybody had that. I didn't think it was anything different until I was talking to somebody and I said that. And they're like, what are you talking about? You know, and I explained it to them and they're like, you know, I think it might've even been my professor in school. And he goes, no, that's synesthesia. Mm -hmm. And he goes, it's often, it often runs in families. Mm. So really? So I asked my mom if she ever had that. She goes, oh, yeah, but she never <laughs> mentioned it to me. <laughs> and uh, it was the same thing, the music and colors. And then I asked my nephew, who I've been helping him with painting because he's a, an engineer, but he's also uh, painting. And uh, he goes, yeah, I get that, too. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really neat. Uh, we do have a question that came in uh, from the audience, from Anae. What kind of colors and textures come out based on your favorite music? I am in awe that uh, you see colors when you hear music. I was practicing closing my eyes, listening to the five rhythm songs and couldn't see colors at all, but it was neat to respond to the music. So the question, um, what kind of colors and textures come out based on your favorite music? Hmm. I think um, I see mostly a lot of um, layers of reds. And so depending on the music, if I'm, and this, this is weird because it happens sometimes when I'm listening to uh, science lectures too. I did a painting based on Feynman's physics lecture. And because it was like getting into my mind, it was getting these thoughts of quantum computing and, and uh, time has always been a concept that I'm always looking for. Hmm. So it, it's not just like if I put on music and I start to paint, I will listen to the song over and over and over again before I do anything. Like mm -hmm. I finished a piece for a friend for a song for a particular album. And the colors that came out were a wide range of blues, silvers, and some gold. Mm, beautiful. And another piece I did um, for someone else with his music, 
it came out there were a lot of there were a lot of blues and then i actually add a lot of interference colors which mm -hmm. are colors that do a color shift mm -hmm. and um but when i'm listening to different music i seem to go with a lot of reds and yellows mm -hmm. so maybe i don't know if that, that says about my color my music choice but mm. sometimes jazz we usually rock and roll okay but the five rhythms were, was that monica who asked the question and nay Ane, oh, Ane, okay. So, because that was the, the five rhythms was something that I used to use with um, um, people in groups that I would run. And it was like just moving your body to these different sounds. And I think, and it might just take some practice of doing it over and over and just uh, letting your mind totally relax. And it's maybe when you're least expecting that it, it might happen. Mm. Mm -hmm. Well, and and Annie asks further, how do you best discover if and which senses influence you? So that would be uh, one way with the five rhythms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, what about other, hmm, do you have other sort of practices or, or things that artists can do to, to fully discover? I think, I think moving, you know, and getting your body moving, before you paint and just when you're painting too I think if you can move your 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 body even if you're painting small maybe do some movements before you approach the piece and that's going to loosen up the the way you're going to apply the the paint of course if you're doing detail work you don't want to do that but um, <laughs> you know I think we were talking a couple of weeks ago in the um, studio practices. I was on that panel and it was interesting to see we all have different kind of routines that we go into. And I, I think, um, and as a cognitive scientist, there are applications. I mean, when people, we have routines that we do that they actually enhance our performance. So whether, you know, sometimes there's crazy things that athletes might do that, you know, and it's really been shown that that does enhance their performance because mainly because they believe it will. Ah, right. So it sets your mindset into that place of like, okay, I'm going to do this and it's going to really help me. So mm -hmm. whether it's, I walk into the garden, I look at, you know, I listen to the sounds of the birds, I'm smelling the, I'm just observing everything that I can, mm -hmm. and just taking it in and knowing that that's going to come back inside with me. Mm -hmm. And it's going to just kind of nurture the spirit. Mm -hmm. Rather than for personally, for me, I, I don't like to have a lot of things that I'm listening to, unless I'm doing something more technical, and so yesterday I was in the studio, I was working on some technical aspects and I'm listening to an audio book. Mm -hmm. But if I'm just in that early stage of bringing something forth, it's almost more meditative. Mm -hmm. So maybe even if somebody sits for, you know, two or three minutes of meditation mm -hmm. and just kind of letting clear in your mind, yeah. doing some deep breathing. Mm -hmm. Before you begin, I think that will open your senses and your awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a good thing to add to someone's practice. Um, you mentioned earlier about feeling your well. If you can't go outside or go hiking or or whichever, um, you must feel it. You must feel that you're empty. Or what's that experience like? And uh, what if you can't get out? How does it influence your work? Well, <laughs> I had somebody once say to me, uh, this was in art school, and he said, you are never going to run out of ideas. And, and it's like, it's true. My mind is kind of always going. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's always that, well, what if? I mean, I could be sitting here, I could spot something over there. Well, what would happen if this? And it's just that following the breadcrumbs kind of thing. So it's not that I'm going to run out of ideas. Mm -hmm. I know that's not going to happen. But it's a matter of finding a sort of balance within the personal life, the creative life, 
and all of that. And I get asked that a lot because people say, oh, you're so productive. You know, how do you find balance in, in your life? And, mm -hmm. and I was thinking it's almost more like a, a cantilevered composition. You know, it's not, it's not always like this, you know, it's like, boom, here I've got a lot of this going on and there may be something over here balancing it. Okay. So I used to find that if I would get a cold or something in February, and it would make me have to sit down and just maybe drink tea, read a book, relax, even for about a week. Mm -hmm. And then it would be, boom, I'm back at it. And so finally, I started going, well, what's, what's up with that? And it's like, well, maybe I should just try doing that without being sick. <laughs> Novel idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now I take that, you know, it's just, you know, a vacation. I'll just sit and... I like to go through um, magazines and pull out things, colors that might inspire me, images that might inspire me. And I just pull them out. Sometimes they end up in, in a, a sketchbook. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, I just look at them and, and it gets encoded and it'll come out later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a, a thinking journal where I keep yeah uh, and this is actually something my mentors uh, having us do so if I see something that I can actually like cut a piece off and put it in my book or go for a walk and write down the experience or something like that great way to process and bring the yes. experiential into the yes exactly mm, yeah so um I've heard you've said uh my imagination is an interesting place to live in can you talk a bit about what that means and <laughs> practice engaging your imagination? Well, it's it's like I was just saying, you know, I, I just see something and, and I start to tell a story about it. Mm. And from that story, it's like it can go into the metaphysical, it can go into the scientific, it can be, you know, like right now I'm sitting in my office and there's a, a bird fountain right, right outside and there are all these birds flying around and they're eating all the berries. And, and so my mind goes into a story of, you know, either goddesses of with birds and you know then my imagination is like oh well I could paint that and what's the story behind that or mm -hmm. more the scientific element of the birds and why are they doing this and, mm -hmm. and you know it'll jump over to oh sonar and how do they track that <laughs> so so I mean that's just a microsecond in my head yeah yeah I love that I'd love to be a fly on the wall in your head <laughs> but like I said, it just, it just, it never is boring. And I use that to my advantage. Like there is a point when I first wake up, but I'm not fully conscious about a half an hour in the morning before mm -hmm. I've had coffee, where I'm just kind of uh, use that half 20 minutes to half hour to solve technical issues. And maybe it's that same kind of thing of doing the statistics at that early hour. There's a part of my brain that is just really open mm. to possibilities of mm. seeing things from a different perspective. And I think as artists, you know, the more we understand our own process, that you can tap into that, whether it's using your dreams or meditation or exercise or different forms to get outside of ordinary time, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're kind of setting aside this time for the exceptional to come through, mm -hmm. possibilities, and to perhaps create a routine around that. For me, that routine is, you know, it doesn't involve much more than just lying in bed. So <laughs> it's an easy routine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you prefer to create and paint in the mornings um, or, or are you good at any time of day? No, I usually work uh, during the day. I don't usually paint at night. Mm -hmm. It's really weird. I used to be a night person. And mm -hmm. oh, I, well, I was a bartender, so I would. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I made jewelry during the day and bartended at night. So mm -hmm. I would you know, be a very late night person. Mm -hmm. And then when I went uh, back to school, I was still working on the weekends at night, but 
I became a morning person. I mean, even when I was a little kid, I was a night person. So it was strange to switch to being a morning person. Now I wake up early in the morning. Mm -hmm. I find I do my best writing before noon. Then I let things kind of sit and I'll go back and look at it with fresh eyes the next day. But painting is pretty much done during the day. And then the evening is just spent for other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I ask um, what, what's been the hardest thing you've had to deal with in your art journey or, or I don't know, the, the a discouragement that you had to process and overcome? Anything like that? Well, you know, of course, we all have rejections, mm. you know, and, and yeah. my, I have a, used to be with a critique group and one of the women in that, she goes, oh yeah, I've got my rejection file, you know? Oh. And so, you know, every time you get a rejection letter or email or whatever, you know, she'd put it in that folder mm. and it just, it's about, if you're not trying, you're not going to get rejected. You're not going to get rejected unless you ask. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the one of the hardest things, and it's kind of a, a reverse thing of what happened. Uh, I spent uh, ten years working in a in mental health field mm -hmm. as a, as at a residential treatment facility. Part of that was when I was going to school, and uh, and then the other part I was working as an artist. But, you know, the, the plan was is that when I finished school, I, I was going to be working there full time. And, you know, I had, I was single, I had a mortgage I had to pay, you know, and bills. And so I thought, okay, well, this, this will be good. And so I graduated. And then my boss at the time, she's like, no, I hired two people to replace you. So you go do your art. Oh, yeah. And I was like, what? <laughs> you just fired me after I'd spent five years getting this degree so I could work with you. And so I was really angry. And I was really angry for a while. And I mean, I had to go. I worked as a housekeeper, a house cleaner mm -hmm. for a couple of months until then I ended up going back, staying at work at the same place, but in an administration. Okay. And that just about killed me. It made me sick. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, okay, so here I am doing what I think I'm supposed to do. And then somebody rejects me to tell me to go be an artist. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's, you know, it's kind of a backwards thing, but it took a few years. And then I was like, okay. And I see, you know, then I could look at it and not be upset and angry. Mm -hmm. And it was the best thing that happened. Mm -hmm. Between that and my, my professor retiring, because I was on my way to do my doctoral studies in neuroscience, mm -hmm. and then I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking with you now mm -hmm. if that would have happened. So, you know, I kind of look, hindsight's always twenty twenty. I look mm -hmm. back and... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that is interesting because it's usually the opposite story for artists, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's what did they reject to become an artist? Um, yeah, I love that. I, I, that must have been incredibly hard after five years. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was. But, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it took a few years for me to really get over it. But now it's like the best gift I ever had. Mm. I think big gifts like that. Mm -hmm. big, really big gifts. Uh, and I used to tell my clients, I said, the best gifts come in the strangest packages. That's right. So you, yeah. you got to let suspend that judgment. That's right. Yeah, you never know when the hard thing is going to actually be yeah. the greatest blessing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's been true of all the big, the big blessings in my life with the hard mm -hmm. ones. Yeah. Do you want to expand on that? <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> I mean, more more on a personal level, um, but but yeah, it's. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I've been thirty years in recovery from uh, addiction, and so that was a big turning point in my life. Mm -hmm. That's what got me back to school. Okay. Okay. So fantastic! Congratulations. 
Thank you. So, I mean, it was it was difficult at the end. And, and so the, the situations that led me to recovery were very difficult and mm. the best gift that I ever got. Absolutely. Yeah. And I know I can reflect on life and see how those hard journeys really grew me, right? And then made me ready for some other big steps that were huge. Yeah. They were really great. Yeah. Yeah. Life is, life is funny that way. It's always interesting, isn't it? It is, yeah. <laughs> a comment has come in. Love that you have found your rhythm and what works best at different times of the day. I'm discovering details about my own, and it's really helpful to honor the natural tendencies we have at different times. Mm -hmm. I often wake up around 4 a.m., and I've started getting up, creating for a couple of hours, and then going back to sleep. It happens to be the best time for me to be in the flow. That's really cool. That is. Yeah. That's perfect that you recognized that and were able to move mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. Instead of being frustrated and no, I need to sleep, which is what I would do. Yeah. Know. <laughs> and some people it's like, you know, especially when you're working another job and you get home and, you know, maybe you've got family to take care of and other things you've got to do. And it's like, where do I find the time to do this, to make art? And it's really a way of looking at your creative process that I think is important. And I did this in one of my groups and I asked them just to commit to a certain amount of time that they were going to spend. Mm -hmm. And they did. And they, they said, oh, well, I'm going to put it low because I, you know, I've got a lot of other things going on. And they found that they were actually much more creative and spent more time than they had anticipated. Good. And part of the exercise was to pay attention to the creative process isn't always happening when you're sitting there with a paintbrush in your hand. Mm -hmm. So to be, to be aware of that process, that creative process, and to honor that and to say, okay, well, maybe I didn't pull out my paints today, but I did think about this. And I thought, oh, well, I could do that and, you know, make these associations. So it's all part of the process. Yeah, I love that. The, the actual painting or creating part is more the outcome of, of the process. Yeah. Oh, I love that too. The paint is the, the outcome of this whole other thing we're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My friend once said, um, another teacher I've worked with, and, and she was going, by the time I sit down to make it, it's like I've already had all my fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, it's like, okay, now I have to do the actual physical part of making this, but figuring it all out, mm -hmm. that was the most fun. Well, and I know that I, so I am learning how to be an intentional, like be an artist 100% of the time, even when I'm not in my studio, right? Like always taking in and trying to be aware of what right. I'm responding to in my environment. Um, but I know on a more practical sense, I, I teach about, you know, doing all the work like the sketches, the color palette, like the more, um, you know, the meaty parts that we're actually going to create the work with, but to work that all out before I touch the canvas so that when I'm at the canvas, it can, it can all just come out. I don't need to make these big decisions. Everything's done. I just, I just, put it on the canvas and enjoy the process of the laying down of paint and the creating of color so I can just enjoy the painting for the sake of painting uh, a little bit different but but uh yeah I like that let the painting be the outcome of the, the work and I, I I like that idea of, I mean I love making color charts and but when I start a painting it turns into a completely intuitive process. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I might have an idea, okay, I'm gonna use this palette. This, to me, the most important things are the, the size and the shape. Mm -hmm. I like to work in weird shapes. Like right now I'm working on three five foot uh, pieces that are only like eight inches wide. So they're really long skinny oh, pieces. Cool. And they talk to each other, but they're not like a triptych. Okay. And so I kind of had all of these things laid out, ideas where I was going, and then it completely changed when the mm -hmm. process began. Mm -hmm. And I have learned to just honor that, that it's, it's, the painting's going to tell me. Mm -hmm. And I've saved myself a lot of um, 
time by just saying, okay, well, I have this idea. And I'll sit down and dialogue with the painting. It's like, so you have a different idea. Okay, mm, what do you want me to do? Yeah. And so then it's like, first thing pops in my head, oh, well, maybe I should do this. And, and so then I try that. And then what's the next step? And so I start with intention and it evolves. Mm. And then every mm-hmm. once in a while, there'll be a painting that's just birthed so easily. It just pops out of nowhere. And it's like, wow, that was easy. And it's like, it almost feels too easy. Like, oh, did I cheat? What happened? <laughs> why, why did that come around so easy? <laughs> it's always re- like, oh. Yeah, it's reassuring to hear uh, from a master artist that you still have work that come out difficultly that are a challenge. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'll pull something out and it's like, oh my gosh, what was I thinking when I painted that? (laughs) Because every time, you know, every day you're doing something more, like you said, you're paying attention, you're doing all these steps to being an artist, Mm -hmm. your observations. So if I pull something out that I painted three, four years ago, and I look at it with my eyes today, I'm going to see so many things that I didn't see before. Yeah, yeah. And I can go back in there and make changes. And I, that's okay with me. My, my neighbor, who's also an artist, um, he's like, oh no, once it's finished, you know, it's archived, it's documented, it's, you know, that it's got to stay that way. It's like, okay, you know, that's good. (laughs) You know, for you, it's just not the way I work. Yeah. For him, it's a, it's a time capsule. It's a talking about that time. Right. He was an artist. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, just a reminder to our audience, um, I'm going to stick around when the hour is up to talk a bit about Mastrius. Um, Sandra is one of our master artists who's mentoring aspiring and emerging artists, and so I can share a bit about that. And we'll give away a one-month events membership as well. Yay. So Yay! Then you can come to all our events for a month. Yeah. 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 Well, that's great. So um, I always like to ask um, ad nauseum if you could have given yourself advice when you were an earlier artist that you 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 learned or earned the hard way if you could have saved yourself that what advice would you have given yourself I would have told myself to just trust in the process and not be so concerned with what everybody else thought Mm. and um you know and I think that's that's true today even if it was yeah. true when I was first starting out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we're creating, you know, it's kind of a double-edged sword if you're creating for yourself, but if you're creating for things that are commercial, you know, to be sold in a gallery. Mm-hmm. And um, I was always, you know, kind of in surviving, like I had to make stuff to sell, yeah. to make a living. And, and now I'm getting older to the point to where now I just want to make things I'm working looking at more installation projects mm-hmm. and uh kind of it's like uh, you know going around full circle so I would have told my younger self to just trust in this process that if I'm open and show up mm-hmm. that I'll get where I need to go mm-hmm. yeah I love that yeah we sometimes have these ideas of you know what success looks like and what the steps are to get there yeah I mean I I have a friend and it's like oh well if I got into a gallery that I'd be successful I said if you got into a gallery that's the first step do they sell your work you know (laughs) (laughs) that's the next step so or if is that what you really want Mm -hmm. understanding what you want and of course that's going to change over time you know yeah. As we grow and, you know, we age, everything changes, you know, our expectations and what we want. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I love doing these interviews and talking to artists because everyone's experience is so unique, of course, and the journey to getting where you are is very unique. Um, I, 
I come from, like I mentioned, my mom was an artist, but the, that was the only picture I had of what it was to be a successful artist was to be gallery represented and sell your work. And you just paint the same thing over and over and over again. And so now that I'm in masters, my mind is just, you know, wide open uh, hearing other stories and what does it mean to be an artist? And, and what about this authenticity and that, that there's something inside of me that needs to come out? Um, all concepts that are pretty new for me even too. Um, and, and that's such an exciting thing to be an artist, to be, right? It is, to just be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, I remember I had one student in a workshop and I said something about being an artist. And she goes, oh, I never want to be considered an artist. Mm. I'm like, why not? And her experience was taking a painting class at a museum um, school and the artist was just very negative and condescending and mm -hmm. arrogant. And she goes, I never want to be like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and so I redefined, had her redefine her idea of artist. And it's like just somebody who is open and aware, mm -hmm. taking it in, processing, and putting it out. I mean, as a cook, as a, you know, a writer, you know, a musician, art is really all about that. And it's like, if, if I find myself making up cookie recipes, I know it's time for me to get back in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I know too, uh, an artist who's dear to my heart, who will not call herself an artist because her artwork isn't good enough yet. And she, mm. won't even, she won't even sign her paintings yet. And if she's in the audience, she knows who she is. Um, but she, she is an artist through and through. And so um, how, do you, how do you encourage someone to, yeah, redefine what artist is and to mm -hmm. believe that it's actually who you are innately made? And maybe using the word creative rather mm. than artist. Yeah, um, I think artist carries a lot of weight for some people. Expectation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas being a creative is more all-encompassing. Mm -hmm. That uh, my grandfather was uh, creative in that sense that he was had a restaurant. He was a chef. He did. He was a ceramic artist. He, you know, repaired things. He, and he had a fourth grade education. When they left Mexico, he had to drop out of school when they came to this country and he had to work in the restaurant. So, you know, I don't know if he ever considered himself an artist like his sister, who was the one who taught me, but yet he was just as creative, if not more so than she was. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and look at your roots, right? Like that, that's kind mm -hmm. of my, my dad was creative in the garage. Right. With, yeah. Fixing and, and building and yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's a really broad. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's a mindset. Hmm. Yeah, I think so too. I think so too. Yeah. That's when you that's, can embrace that ability and just expand your mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's but, the first step. Yeah, wear that hat and see how it fits if you like it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you can just you know keep changing the hats and be a multimedia artist. Yeah, totally. Okay. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love that. Mm. Oh well, we we are pretty well at the hour here. That was um, that was great. I really enjoyed diving into your imagination and synesthesia. <laughs> Uh, really fascinating. Hey, you said it quite easily it now. Without, without stuttering. Because <laughs> I think you have it too, if you're seeing. Uh, yeah, I do. Just pay attention to that some more and see how that goes. Yeah, I am. I'm definitely going to uh, okay. do more closing my eyes and, and seeing and feeling and smelling and tasting and seeing what, what yeah. bubbles up to the surface. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Julie, for inviting me here. Mm -hmm. It's Absolutely. wonderful to be a part of this family. I'm really enjoying being able to connect with people mm -hmm. through the mentoring program. Oh, good. Yeah. And, and it's as much for the mentors as it is for the artists receiving mentorship. It's so it's life giving. And I'm so glad that you're part of our community, Sandra. Thank you. <laughs>